Better at Beach Volleyball podcast. My name is Mark Burrick. It is not Kim Hildreth like you see on the screen, but we don't have a graphics guy yet. So uh, today we are interviewing volleyball pro and health and nutrition coach Kim Hildreth, who came from Florida, comes from Florida, and uh, she had a, a tremendous couple years on the NVL long ago. And in 2019, had an absolute breakout year on the AVP. And we're here to you know, pick her volleyball, health, and nutrition brain and uh, see what we can glean from her game, her experience. Uh, so I hope you guys are ready for a fantastic interview. And without further ado, I'd like to present uh, my guest for the day. Kim Hildreth, what's going on, Kim? There's hey, how's it going, Mark? Rounds of applause. <laughs> Thousands of people are firing up. Um, <laughs> yeah, just want to say hi. You know, we we're, were talking off camera a little bit about uh, <laughs> credit card points for travel <laughs> and uh, these young rookies who don't even have a travel credit card and just giving away free points. And I know that you don't just have knowledge in travel, but uh, you have a ton, a wealth of knowledge for volleyball, beach volleyball, as well as as your company. Um, I believe the the email address is uh, Health Coaching with Kim. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the website healthcoachingwithkim.com. Yep, that's my business. Awesome. I can't wait to get into that. And uh, I'd love to have you on the other podcast once we get running with that. It's called Entrepreneur Athlete. It's people who turn their sport passion into their career. Um, and maybe we can hook up again for that. But for today... I just want you to give like a small, brief little interview of when and why did you start playing, let's call it volleyball and beach volleyball. <laughs> um, I started playing volleyball because my older sister, Tina, played. I'm the youngest, and so my both, both my older sisters played, so I was always at the gym watching them play. Um, and I think that's probably most people's sports story is like, <laughs> you know, watching somebody else do it. Uh, so I started playing um Totally fell in love. I don't know what it is about keeping the balloon off the floor. That's like so fun, but <laughs> um, that's always been just, you know, found an early passion for it. And then I actually started playing beach volleyball, my like going into my freshman year of college in Michigan. Um, I was playing in, in high school in the summers. I found out that there was more volleyball I could play in the summer than just volleyball camps that I could play like grass tournaments and grass leagues and stuff. So mm -hmm. I kind of got in with the local adult community when I was like 16, 17 years old and started playing some of those tournaments, um, like grass triples, grass fours. And so you kind of, uh, you cut your teeth in, in Michigan. Yeah. Was the move to Florida the recent as an adult, was it for volleyball? Yes. So I ended up moving to Florida initially to play. Um, I got to sneak in one year of beach volleyball um, in college and I played at the University of North Florida. So that was my first move to Florida. And then um, kind of from there, I was finishing up my master's degree and needed to, you know, get kind of an internship job with the university. And I landed a spot at the University of South Florida, which was what brought me to Tampa. Um, and then when I moved to Tampa, I found Kristen Batt, Megan Wallen, Shara Harris, Raquel Ferreira, pre Piandosa Lima, Lima. Like, I'm like, wow, there's like really badass volleyball players here. Um, so I kind of started training with, with all those vets, like OGs. And, uh, that's what, you know, really got me into it. And, you know, I definitely considered moving to California around that time too. Um, but my family's in Michigan, so it's just super far. Um, I was definitely broke uh, from like finishing my master's and everything. And so you figured, saying, why like, not pick up volleyball? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I actually. Well, when I that, that's around the time I started playing NBL and I actually started making more money on the NBL and playing like local Florida tournaments than I was making at my internship. And so as soon as I like capped out, I was like potentially going to continue working there. Like I was an academic counselor for the athletic department at the University of South Florida. Okay. Um, but I was you know, like an intern at that level. So I was making hourly something. And I was like, um, I'm making more money playing tournaments and coaching. Like volleyball's fun. I'm like 22. Like I'm just going to keep playing and see where this goes. And uh, it went well. So I kept playing. <laughs> That's awesome. I think you're one of the yeah. few that goes from, you know, their part-time job and can say, huh, I'm actually netting more from volleyball. So, I mean, huge kudos for that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, living in Florida, honestly, is what made that possible because, uh, you know, there's tournaments in Florida every single weekend. I was making the finals pretty consistently. So I'm making anywhere between like 200 and 500 bucks a weekend, like playing in tournaments. And then I was getting a buttload of experience, you know, playing, 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 playing. Like I was still rather new to the beach game at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel like I got a lot of games. (laughs) I mean, I think the first year I literally played like over 40 tournaments in one year. Um, Yeah. Like actually, like I'd play a full tournament on Saturday and then I play full tournament on Sunday. And, you know, now I'm like 12 games deeper into my veteran status. (laughs) That's Um, unreal. I, I mean, I remember coaching this, uh, this USA, performance camp and one of the coaches because it wasn't I'm not very involved in juniors and they looked at the uh, at the girls and they're just like okay you know just raise your hand I forget what the conversation would happen but uh raise your hand if you played over 50 tournaments and everybody's hands went up and I looked at the guy next to me I go he said 15 right and he goes <laughs> no 50 and this was in like a six month period they're like uh, you know because the thing was in the fall and they were talking about summer and i wait Mm. raise your hand if you played over 50 tournaments this summer and these juniors are doing exactly what you did where they can get 50 tournaments in in a few months in a summer and i was like that's obnoxious how is that even possible in a summer and he said oh well the juniors now they have tournaments on tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday sunday because it's summer and uh, my mind was blown. That level of experience. I go, this a sixteen-year-old totally. has more tournament experience than I do at thirty-five. And I was yeah. like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I learned a lot that summer. I think I, you know, I played. If you look at my AVP America list of like partners, it is like a mile long. I played with so many people that year, and uh, really like learned I, th- I think I just learned how to win you know like mm-hmm. I and I learned a lot of different kinds of volleyball and like the more you learn about your side of the net like I played a lot of small ball I played with brand new blockers I played with veteran blockers who might not be as quick you know I learned a lot of like stuff on my side that helps me you know play against teams like that now because I know what it's like you know mm-hmm. so I feel like it, it gave me a lot of perspective on the game playing with so many different people um, you know, and it didn't hurt that I was only paying like 400 bucks a month in rent because it's Florida. Florida. So I was paying my bills and putting <sighs> money away and having a great summer. So, yeah, <laughs> that's so awesome. Can we yeah. like, uh, can we unpack that a little bit about <laughs> learning from different types of players? Because mm-hmm. I, I think there's, there's two schools of thought. And one of them is that, Hey, learn how to stick with a partner and figure out problems with them instead of kind of the typical, like, um, I guess, beach volleyball pro mindset in in the U.S. of something's wrong with my partner, so I'm going to find somebody else next week. You know, that's why we didn't win. It can't be my fault. Instead mm-hmm. of sticking in the discomfort like you had to in college or any other team for four or five years and say, this is my family. These are their quirks. This is what we have to fix or deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that there's more value in playing with multiple people or is there more value in switching um or sorry in sticking through with a teammate and trying to figure out how to solve those uncomfortable problems uh well i did both so i think there's um i think there's a point in your career where you need to stick with a partner to really break into like a top five team kind of situation because like Olympic qualification wise, that's the way it works. Like you have to figure it out with a partner. Um, And so I think, but I think when you can and when you're younger and like still figuring out the game, like I think there is higher value potentially in playing with a lot of different people. Hmm. Um, but it also takes a lot of maturity to play with the same person for a really long time because it becomes like a really intense relationship. So like you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to like, you know, have hard conversations, go through ups and downs with somebody. Um, so I definitely think there's value in both. Um, but I do think like, you know, I think you can reach the top either way, but I do think for, you know, for me, like I really like, I still to this day, like pull on lessons that I learned from like situations of playing with 
different kinds of people with different needs, you know? And mm -hmm. like the more you, like, I feel like the more I've played with different people, the more I've learned about like who my opponents are, not necessarily like that my partner was my opponent, but like there's, you know, the more I know about how different people are and how they react differently to different situations or, you know, what they need on the set or like what their options are on offense or what they're capable of doing on defense because of their athletic ability, size, maturity, age, whatever. Like, I think I just have this like database of, you know, ability to like strategize differently and like mm. know a little bit more intimately, like who my opponents are because of that. Um, so I, I think it's very valuable. I'm kind of like halfway into already doing that this year, like playing with a bunch of different people in the last like year or so too. Um, so I think there's a lot to be, to be learned by that for sure. Yeah. I, th I think there's a ton of value in hearing how other people think about the game. It's mm -hmm. at a, at a certain point, I think a lot of people think 98% the same. You know, mm -hmm. at our level, when we're thinking about AVP, FIVB, I think there's there's all of those basics that everybody needs and has locked in, you know, where they want to pass a uh, setting. I think everybody's sets are usually pretty unique as, as far as what they want and what they expect. But uh, there's there's always that other 2% when you play with somebody new that you're like, oh, that's what you do there? Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, like we we could try that. That's not what I do. And then your uncomfortable conversations that you talked about, I think those are crucial, and I don't see those enough. And I think they're they're tough for a lot of people to actually have that conversation of, no, I want to do this uh, instead of just kind of giving way to your partner, you know, and and where they're comfortable. So how do you? How do you broach the conversation if you're in a, a, a situation where you want a completely different thing in a play than your partner thinks is right mm -hmm. or thinks is correct? How do you tackle that? <laughs> um, I have definitely approached, I uh, had that situation happen with like a variety of different partners and personalities. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's especially hard when it's a game time decision, an important match with someone you don't know very well. And mm -hmm. like you, like I'm like, like, let's say you and I are playing together and we're like in the finals of a qualifier, this game is to get in, you know? And it's like, okay, like I think our best strategy is serving this person this way and doing this on them. And you're like, no, I really believe like I know this other person really well and doing this this way. And I think, like what I've learned like and failed at honestly like a few times in that like in just like fully giving that to my partner or trying to fully take it on myself is I personally think like there's never really a right or wrong answer I feel like when somebody feels really strongly about something you know it's, it's like committing is the most important part but I think where people get tripped up the most is um however you make that decision like personally you know whatever the leadership dynamics are on that team um i think both players need to commit to it and then be open to like learning from what you did so that you can adjust your strategy as necessary and i think what i failed at before and i watch other people fail at is like not paying attention enough and like getting stuck and stubborn enough in what you were doing and mm. like thinking that it's working when like there's a huge difference between is it working like what does working mean does working mean that we're scoring points because in my opinion i think no matter how you're scoring points it's working and i think a lot of people get stuck on like well we're digging her <laughs> yeah so it's working and i'm like well are you transitioning and putting balls away yeah we're like, not a transition team yeah <laughs> maybe it's just not on that day you know mm -hmm. or maybe the way you're digging like i think for me that's a really hard one because like everybody has that one thing when they play that like if they do that one thing really well that they're playing great even if the rest of the game sucks and for me What's that's your defense thing? <laughs> defense if i'm digging balls i'm balling yeah okay. <laughs> if i can't put a ball away to save my life who cares i'm digging like it's kind of like a uh i don't know sometimes it's like an ego thing it's like you know you can't put anything down on me you know I love that. um and you know i've had to check myself and have gone you know when i go back and watch film on some games that i've lost like in important matches it's like yeah, I'm digging, but like I'm digging really difficult balls and we are basically co consistently in an out of system like mm. transition situation. 
So we're giving the other team a free ball back and they're scoring right away. Or like, okay. I'm not able to, you know, whatever happens, the set's really difficult or the hit was really difficult. So we made an error, whatever. And I think a lot of people will look at that and be like, oh, you know, well, we're digging the balls. Like we just need to do better. And I'm like, well, you're not doing better. And like the game goes by like that. So like something that needs to change, you know? Yeah. And I think that ability to like pay attention is what makes or breaks like top players. And I think, you know, getting to live in Florida and like in the last couple of years since Larissa has lived here, like she started playing every single Florida tournament, no matter how much money was on the line or where it was, like they literally played every tournament. And so I got to play Larissa like 15, 20 times in the last like mm -hmm. two years. And I don't know how many Larissa people who's got play. like 50 something uh, world champion, uh, FIVB championships. And yeah. Larissa, Misty. who's the Misty May of Brazil. Like, yes. And yeah. the, the players who don't know her in, in our country or in Florida, who are getting to play her in tournaments, like she's an absolute legend and everybody should go over there and kind of thank her for what she did in volleyball and what she's still Literally. doing. Still yeah. doing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, getting, getting that kind of like really high level experience, like so much over the last two years has really taught me a lot about that because you can tell, like, she is 100% paying attention. Like if you go back and watch like your film against Larissa, she is counting in her head every single time in every situation that you hit this certain ball or why you did something this way. Like, and at the end of the game, she's gobbling that up and putting it in your face, you know, mm -hmm. like, and so I think that ability to ad adapt is more important than the like partnership dynamic of like, what are we going to try? So I think what I've been learning in the last like couple of years is like, it doesn't matter to me. Like I used to need to control it and I feel like I'm pretty good at it. So I like to control it, but like, um, it's not worth like my partner not feeling confident in mm. what they have to say. So if my partner feels really strongly, I'll usually like be like, all right, let's do it but like maintain the ability to like pay attention and be like, okay, great. This is working. Or, okay. No, this is not working. And let's try something else. You know, that's big because you can get into the big ego situation of just trying to wait out your partner being wrong, you yeah, know, totally. where you, you hold on to that and you're just like, see, we lost another point. You know, mentally you're even doing that like lip smacking yes. of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. If we were serving the other person, instead of trying to figure out the person that you are serving, or yep. the, you know, whatever strategy you got, go and say, okay, or this is the strategy we are within. So let's solve all those problems and let's figure out why they're hitting certain spots and what I can do to prevent it within this strategy. A hundred percent. And I think that ego thing is is really important. That's I think something that playing with a variety of people can really give you is just everyone responds differently to conversations like that. Um, and the more mature you are and able to navigate those conversations, the better, which is honestly like why I feel like, you know, my personal business health coaching has been like really successful and why it's something that I really enjoy because I do feel like I have a lot of experience with those conversations and, and what I end up doing and teaching in health coaching is like very similar to what I do in the sport. So it, it's kind of, um, to me, it's one of the most interesting things like about humanity is just like the dynamics of how people work and like how people communicate and converse. And um, so I could nerd out on that all day. <laughs> you know, it's so funny you say that because like the thing that I think in the last two years that has made me a better player and a, and a better coach and definitely a better person overall uh, was the marriage counseling that uh, me and my wife got pre-marriage where they mm -hmm. talk about bringing up the things that you think about differently and, you know, sharing what energy you have and sharing whose role belong, like which role belongs to who. Um, and the ability to actually just sit and just discuss those dynamics instead of even the X and o, X's and O's of volleyball, you know, and understanding that all of us come from a different background. We have a different story. So what you even if you think or you're statistically proven that you're right, you cannot say you're right, you know, when, it, when in a battle against your teammate, because <laughs> your wife's your probably being right now. She's so proud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I dove into some more books than she do. You know? <laughs> she, she had it. She had the natural gift. And I was like, all right, let's study. How do I become a yeah. good person? <laughs> I mean, I totally agree because I think at the end of the day, 
everybody knows how to play this sport. You mm-hmm. know, like I think even like rec players like are really knowledgeable about the inner workings of the sport. And I think the ability to, I think emotional intelligence is one of the most important skills in this sport. And I think that comes is like, you know, there's so many people out there that are just like, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a good communicator. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I'm not good at talking about my feelings. And it's like, okay, I hate when people say I'm not, because then it's like, well, that's part of who you are. So you really, that's like a part of who you were born to be is like someone who's not a good communicator. Like, I really don't agree with that. I, I don't think there are very many things in life that are not practicable skills. And I absolutely think emotional intelligence is one of them. I have done it myself. I have helped other people do it. Like I'm a hundred percent like convinced it is teachable and practicable and really important in beach volleyball. For the guys out there and maybe some of the other ladies, what the hell do you mean by emotional intelligence? Yeah. So great. I teach a lot of guys (laughs) to the like to the basic because what emotional intelligence to somebody who grew up the way that I did Mm -hmm. there, it doesn't have a meaning. It sounds made up and it's an incredibly to me, at least maybe I'm one of the only guys out there who, who, who thinks this way, but it is the vaguest of explanations for what somebody has to be, you know, to match your uh, Bumble profile or whatever. <laughs> I need somebody who's emotionally intelligent. Okay. Yeah. Um, like, cool. Yeah, so, I want to so, be like that, but how? <laughs> yeah. So, so how do you describe emotional intelligence, and then maybe you could relate it back to to volleyball? Yeah. Um, I think emotional intelligence is the ability to. Um, I think it's a mind body connection thing. I think it's the ability to feel in your body when you're something feeling something. And then also the ability to communicate it, that this is what I'm feeling. And so part of the skills that you need to, to be, to have a high level of emotional intelligence is you need to have a good enough vocabulary, frankly, to do it. And I think that's one of the things that people struggle with the most is like, I'm, you know, like, I'm frustrated or I'm upset or you're mad. Like they're just very like basic emotions that people usually use to describe their feelings instead of like, you know, if you're mad, are you actually like disappointed or are you lonely or are you like, you know, unfulfilled? Like these are very different meanings of words and the ability to say what you're feeling and know that in yourself. And then the empathy to like, hold space for somebody else sharing what they're going through, um, or even just have the sensitivity to notice that somebody else is feeling something and be able to communicate. So I think the skills that go with emotional intelligence that aren't talked about enough are communication skills. And those are so practicable, you know, like you can learn a new vocabulary in like a couple of days, like you can start adding new words to that, you know? Could you give me an example of a communication, like let's go with two of them like a, a specific skill, because it, again, this becomes when you say communication skills, um, emotional intelligence, uh, for a lot of people, I think these are very vague statements. If you say you need to work on your passing skills or your volleyball skills, you can say, okay, I need to get her at passing. I need to get her at better at passing float serves. Mm-hmm. So what is one example of a communication skill and how would somebody practice it? Yeah, let me, I think maybe I'll give you a a very real volleyball example of when I watch it happen and when I watch people struggle with emotional intelligence is you are getting picked on, you are getting served every ball and for whatever reason, like it's not your day or maybe you're playing, you know, someone's watching you play that like your boyfriend's there and he's never been there before and you're really nervous because Mm. you want him to think you're good or it's like your first opportunity to get to get to play you know, with someone who's better than you and you're like scared of messing up. And so like in the match, right, you're just like mentally not in the the place that you like to be at, which happens to every single pro, 100%. I can't, there's no way that this has not happened at least one time to everybody who's ever played beach volleyball. Or like that blocker who was, who was always, who had your number in three matches and you just think that he owns you for some reason. Yes. Um, So like emotionally, you're not in this, you're not in your best state to play. And so everybody goes through that. So you're getting picked on. And as a partner, 
having played with a zillion different people, like I have watched a lot of people be in that situation. Um, you know, I've played with a lot of people who have played a lot less volleyball than me. So I've been in the role of like, you know, my partner's getting served a lot in my life and being able to watch them struggle with like not knowing what they need and not being able to communicate to me what I can do to help them, like to raise their confidence, to feel, make them feel supported. I mean, for me, like when I'm in that situation, I know that like, I need to feel like my partner has my back, like no matter what, you know, for whatever insecurity is that I have, like, I need, I need my partner to say, we're in this together. I'm here with you. No matter how bad you play, let's see how we can make it work. Like we, we can still play like poop and win, you know? And those so statements me, would work for you. Like those actual yes. statements would, those would be your, your words yes. of encouragement. Is there Shout anything, out to anyone who ever wants to play with me? <laughs> we, we talk about this because we have um, a little form that we have people fill out like the, the partner profile and we have mm -hmm. our, our turn ons and our turn offs. Do you, mm -hmm. before we go to the, to the next part of what you're saying, do you have any turn offs in that situation that while you're kind of, you didn't side out three balls in a row. Is there anything that you know that if somebody said at that moment, you would just want to punch her in the face and you'd be done, <laughs> you'd like done on the court, you know? Um, I think for me personally, I, it's pretty hard to push me to like a real turn off. Like mm -hmm. I, I think I've seen it, a lot of it. I've experienced a lot of it. Like I've had a partner who like just didn't talk to me like she just was upset about something and literally was like not going to call the ball not going to give me a, a you know call when i'm hitting mm. she was like having just whatever she was going through a lot and uh okay. so you know probably the biggest turn off is like that they would just like be like yeah i'm done i don't want to play this game anymore <laughs> like i think that that would i'd be like well i'm still gonna i guess i'll play one on two i'll see if i can i can figure it out but like okay. i would probably wouldn't play with them after that so um, silence, cold shoulder is probably yeah. your, your worst. Avoidance um, in okay. general, I think. Yeah. Okay. I think I, some I like guys are kind people. of comfortable with that. You know, <laughs> True. You know, there are people who, when, when their partner just like, it goes quiet, it really sucks. Especially if it's, if it's something different from what their norm is. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're playing with somebody who's just always quiet and stoic and just like walks back and doesn't say anything, then you're used to that. But if you're used to the partner who's got energy, who's giving you vocal cues and a little bit of body language, and then there's a, a shift in that where there's zero communication, that's that's bad. But I think I think there's room for people to be successful without being communicative. Uh, yeah, as people well. do it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I don't see Taylor Crab talk very much. All like, right, he's pretty smooth sailing. Uh, and pretty level like not much cheering you know like I, I, everybody has their different states that they're gonna like to see succeed you know at a high level mm -hmm. for for sure yeah okay so um you're talking about uh skills for for how to like an actual communication skill that you're talking about for volleyball yes so that. in that situation where like if you and i are playing together and i can tell like you are shutting down you are emotionally like in a different state than i'm used to seeing you play like two things need to happen on your side and on my side like on your side the more you are able to recognize in yourself that you're shutting down and like, that's the first step. If you don't even know what's happening, which I've been there and I've watched people go through it. Like you go through the whole match and you were completely shut down and you go back and watch the video and you're like, this is like a different player than like all these other videos that I have. Right. I've been like, a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So being able to be self-aware enough to recognize when your emotional state is changing is part of emotional intelligence. And it does take practice. Um, but like I think watching film is a great way to do it volleyball wise, but I think it's a, you know, it's a practicable skill, like literally 24 hours a day of your life. Um, How do you practice it? Practicing being aware is like asking for feedback from other people is a huge one. Like you oh. can ask, yeah, okay. you can ask from, I think a really uh, eye opening exercise for a lot of people is ask your five closest people in your life um, how they see you respond when you're being vulnerable. Oh, that's like when scary. you, when you feel vulnerable. Yeah. It's good feedback. <laughs> um, um, how they ask you feel when, when you're feeling vulnerable or how they think you respond. 
when yeah, you feel and how vulnerable. they can tell what what you do typically when you feel vulnerable um and that like the more you talk about it the more you can become aware of it um and so a lot of times the first step to becoming aware is reflection because you're not able to be aware of it in the moment you're only able to be aware of it once it's already happened but mm -hmm. the more you so it's like this exercise there's like have you ever heard of lucid dreaming yeah it's like when you're being able to like be a little bit aware when you're dreaming and the yeah, way you're... you be yeah the way I've had practice. some of my worst dreams. I actually got disappointed in myself from a lucid dream. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've never, yeah. I've never patted my own back on my creativity or my like artistic ability. And I was swimming in the ocean. I know this is a side story, but I, I was I'm swimming ready. in the <laughs> ocean and uh, there was like, I was able to breathe for a really long time underwater. And I was like, Oh, huh, bah. Uh, and then I saw this uh, sea creature and I looked at it and I said, there is no possible way that you are real. And then I realized <laughs> that I was dreaming and I was like disappointed. I go, Mark, this is the best your imagination could come up with. <laughs> You're, you have zero artistic ability, but hey, we're still dreaming. So let's see what's going on. And then I just like <laughs> swam around for the rest. But I, I remember like being like, you suck at art, Mark. Because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't dream of a good creature. <sighs> <laughs> Uh, so that was, that was me being yeah. terribly vulnerable, so vulnerable. <laughs> that was great. I love, I love the anecdote, and I think everybody needed a little more insight into your life. <laughs> Just, <laughs> uh, Don't ask me to draw. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, but so lucid. If you look it up, if you Google like how can I lucid dream, it'll tell you like set an alarm in the middle of the night to wake you up and journal immediately what you remember dreaming and so it's the same exercise it's like you can't do it while you're dreaming right you have to stop dreaming and then write about it but mm. the more you do that your brain starts to connect faster and faster so that you will be become aware while you're doing it it's just like you know if someone if someone's trying to get you to pass better and they're like you need to lock your elbows when you, when you pass right you might need like like if I'm in your one of your camps, Mark, like I might need you because I can't think about it while the ball's in the air coming to me. So every time after I pass, you tell me, Kim, lock your elbows. Oh, shoot. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So enough times of you telling me after it happens, eventually I'm going to be able to do it while it's happening. Same concept. So like, how do you become more aware of your emotional state of when you're shutting down of what you're doing is a lot of reflection and like journaling about it can be really helpful or just having conversations about it with people and like kind of like reflecting on what happened. Um, and eventually you're going to start to be aware in the moment when it's happening. So I love that question. I think loving like practical applications to this stuff are really missed sometimes. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and you also said uh, vulnerable, like when you're feeling vulnerable, I don't, I don't. And I don't think uh, a lot of people may, maybe again, I'm alone in this. But I don't understand what feeling vulnerable is. Okay, so practically what feeling vulnerable is, is like vulnerability is the moment when you put yourself out there mm -hmm. um, that like something's on the line and outside, like someone else could take the thing that you're putting out there and hurt you with it. And so I think uh, Brene Brown has a really great definition of vulnerability that I probably just totally butchered. Um, but she does a really good job. There's a thing on, I think it's on Netflix. It's called the call to courage that I think anyone who ever wants to play sports should watch. And it's basically about like stepping into the arena and being vulnerable is being willing to step into the arena and put yourself out there. So using, I'll use myself as an example, you know, like I could go, you know, step on the volleyball court and like, I have had great results in the past and I've had you know, not great results in the past. And last year wasn't my best year on the ABP. I didn't, I was in the main draw, but didn't win a match in the main draw. Mm. And like the fact I could be like, ah, you know, I didn't like that. It didn't feel good. I definitely didn't feel good about it. Like I had a lot of, you know, shame. I didn't like, I was like, I'm going to quit volleyball or I could continue to step into the arena and put myself out there and be like, I could, you know, go to Austin and go, oh, and two again and feel all those same feelings and everybody could watch me do it or I could just quit and not walk and walk away, you know, and like not be vulnerable. So me putting myself out there for everyone to see that, or like people that are important to me to see, you know, that I could fail 
is like putting myself in a vulnerable position. And I think in the volleyball game, you get beach volleyball, you get forced to be in a vulnerable position. Like if I'm going to serve you every ball, Mark, every ball, I'm going to tell you before the match, I'm going to serve you every freaking ball. And if you are this much nervous about it, you are vulnerable by staying in the match, you know? Yeah. And so you, could, I think you could escape that vulnerable position by, I think I, I, as somebody coach, like I think junior girls a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed the giggle or, or the, this is just fun. Um, mm -hmm. this yeah. is, uh, I don't really care. I'm going to make a joke out of it. It uh, became an escape from what you're saying was, was vulnerability. 100%. So instead of seeing them struggle and potentially fail, uh, they would escape it by doing the, the giggle and yeah, I'm hurt. I'm not taking it, it seriously. Funny. It's not that important to me, you know, but when you step on the court and you say it's really important to you and you're actually giving your all that's putting yourself in a vulnerable position. And I think everybody who wants to play volleyball at a high level or even the highest level that they can be, whatever level that might be, I think you're putting yourself in that position. I think it's very brave and I think you'll learn a lot of life lessons from it. Hmm. So, to, so if I were to translate uh, vulnerable, vulnerable is essentially a wager on yourself where you know it's not a sure bet. Yeah. Um, and maybe emotionally, do you have an example of that between just two people uh, instead of volleyball? Because like showing up to a tournament and playing and trying your hardest and telling everybody that you're playing in a tournament and that you try really hard. That's mm -hmm. I can see that as putting yourself in a vulnerable position where you're like, yeah. hey, I know that I'm putting myself on spotlight. I know that everybody knows that I'm working as hard as I can and I might still fail. So they might see my hard work as um unvaluable or in some way you know well yeah and i think i think the uh, everybody could resonate with the feeling of being scared that you're just not good enough that like mm -hmm. you could work just as hard and do all the things you could put all your team together you could be doing every single possible thing that you could be doing and you know what like you still don't get the results so that must mean that i'm just not good enough and i think that results oriented mindset is what stops people from putting themselves in that position um, mm -hmm. because they think the only thing that they have to gain is either it all or lose it all you know it's all or nothing they have there's no nothing to be gained by actually trying in the process even if you fail um so you know an example between two people i think is just you know it, it can be the smallest things. Like I think there can be really small moments of vulnerability. It can be, you know, uh, me telling my husband, like, you know, I, I had a really long day and, or actually even easier. Like I could be like, Hey, Mark, I want to play with you this season really bad. And I'm, I'm like, not going to, I'm going to wait for you. You can go through all your options and I'm just going to wait it out because you're my number one pick. And waiting for you to either accept or reject me is putting myself in a vulnerable position, you know, whether or not anybody else knows that because, you know, you know, and mm -hmm. it's clearly important to me that, you know, so I think vulnerability can be and usually is like very little moments that that can make or break, you know, relationships for sure. How do how do two friends become vulnerable with each other? You know, I, I'm still, I don't know why I don't understand this, this concept of, mm -hmm. of being vulnerable that I do understand saying like, you're going to try as hard as, as you can for absolutely everything. And then being like, but, um, that's it with a lot of people looking at you, but in between two people or two like friends, mm -hmm. I don't know. Is it like admitting that you have a, a problem with an addiction? That to me, okay, that that might be expressing some some vulnerability and hoping that your friend doesn't just be like, oh, well, you're weak, um, or you know, they showing that they still have some support. But mm -hmm. what else aside from that could be an an example? Um, I mean, I think the ability to fully be able to be yourself without acting around somebody is like expressing vulnerability to its fullest really mm -hmm. um you know so like you know you and i know each other well enough i would say like we're friends but like we don't know each other super well 
Um, like we don't spend a whole lot of time together. I don't know like a ton about your background or you about mine. So like, even just between us, like, I think like having a conversation where you have a thought that you're like, uh, you know, like I could share this, but like, I'm not going to, that's like a moment where you choose to be vulnerable or not. And like, I wouldn't say that every situation that you have that thought, like, again, all or nothing mindset, I think is really not helpful in any situation. I don't, I don't think anybody could convince me that an all or nothing, unless you're like, in war, maybe. <laughs> yeah, because like, I've been told uh, by friends and loved ones that I express my mind uh, too much. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I, I can relate to that totally. And so, you know, maybe being vulnerable is like, for me, sometimes being vulnerable is letting go of control, you know, and like being okay with like, I'm not going to say something or I'm not going to be the kind of, you know, the, I'm not going to try to put my hands in something because it's actually scarier for me to like, let somebody else take the wheel. You know, mm -hmm. that's also being vulnerable. It's putting something that I'm not comfortable with in the hands of somebody else. Like I'm about to look up this definition from Brene. It's really <laughs> good and it'll be great for the podcast, but <laughs> does that well, answer your question a little bit more? It's getting there. Okay. It's getting there to say that, uh, that I fully understand it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't. And, and I know there, there's probably going to be a few hundred people just rolling their eyes saying, how do you not understand? Like, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, there, there are certain points where I definitely understand it. But then an understanding towing the line of, well, how do you how do you be yourself, express what you say? It, you don't offend people nonstop because you say what you think and what you feel. You know, if I, if I think something's stupid, I, I've been known to say, I think that's stupid. Uh, and that makes them, you know, that puts them on the line. And I have, I have sacrificed friendships where I've been at the point where I say, you know what, I'm a better leader and a person. And I think that this person, while they need to hear it in order to be the best person that they are, and it might break our relationship but no one else has the courage to tell them. And so I will put a relationship on the line to try to help somebody. And say, I think like, that's being you vulnerable. Might, you might hate me for this. And here we go, because I think you need to hear it. You know? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, that the friends that are, the people in my life who are willing to challenge me when I'm not being the person that I say that I want to be are the people that I would count as my closest friends. And that means that there's times like, you know, right now there's like a friend that I'm super close with that we had a misunderstanding and both sides we were hurt and we still expressed both of us. Like you are still one of my closest friends. We need to talk about this at some point, but like right now, like our relationship needs some space. And mm -hmm. I think that that's where true relationships happen when there's the ability to like change, like real vulnerability can, and like real connection can handle change. And um, so like, n it's just having the maturity to know that like relationships in life are going to ebb and flow and like having the security in yourself enough to know that like it's okay if my, if some of my relationships change like that i think is like <laughs> you know a high goal to reach and i think like can show you like really what people in your life you know are really there and really not and like some people i feel like think vulnerability is like this person that i can just like share everything with and they know all my deep dirty secrets and i i just i definitely used to think that way too but I don't anymore. I, I think some of the people that I would say I've been the most vulnerable with and they with me, I don't know that. I don't know all those things about them. There's just not like the ability and the time, I think, to like, to have that relationship with everybody. So I really think it's a matter of just like that, that person is able to bear their soul to you when and if the time comes or like put, is willing to fight through when they're feeling hurt like to find connection. Like, I think that's vulnerability. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot of different dynamics that it can be, but I think it, it boils down to really like 
being willing to put yourself out there when you'd rather not knowing that you could get hurt if you do. Yeah. I guess that maybe that would be one of your challenges when you're coaching um, both your, your life and your, your health and your wellness uh, students is uh, (laughs) trying to help them navigate the line between just inappropriately opinion expressing (laughs) and being comfortable with sharing your thoughts and feelings uh, with somebody. And I, there's gotta be a, a difficult line there that I think a lot of people toe or they don't know but you know maybe the people who are super angry and super opinionated there's an argument from our definition here that those might be the most vulnerable people or there's an argument against it saying well you're not being vulnerable because you're just pushing people away and shutting them down and they don't get to have an opinion that challenges yours you know i think both i i i definitely think I think people think it's so complicated, but from my experience, like I literally like to the T was just like have a client right now that I'm working on with that. Like they are like so uncomfortable with what to share, when to share, like every single time that we talk, um, you know, she's like, you know, should I have said this or do I do this? And I'm like, I cannot tell you what's best for your life. I can give you my perspective on what I think socially, but honestly, my opinion is, doesn't matter because what matters is you feel good about yourself. And I think the problem that most people have is like, they have lost so much trust with themselves by not speaking from an authentic place. Like how you said, you were like, man, I was willing to put my relationship on the line because this mattered to me. Like that is like deep in your soul. You can't like not, you're not hiding from it. You're looking at it and you're knowing that like this could suck, but like, if I don't, I'll regret it you know, Mm. and like having that moment where I think, you know, I actually wrote a blog on it one time. Like, I think the moment of living with no regrets is when you're completely authentic to yourself. Like I I sometimes like to use, like, if you're in a dating relationship, well, you know, if you actually are dating to like find a life partner versus like dating for fun, because you just like companionship and both are valid. But like, if you're in a place where you're looking for a life partner, like you will probably have regrets if you don't treat them like your life partner from the first time you start dating, you know, like as soon as you guys agree that you're on the same commitment level, if you're like waiting to see if it works out to actually be acting the way you want to be, you're probably going to have regrets, but like it would hurt more if you were all in and treated them exactly like you would treat, you know, the person in your life and they, they still left you. Then you'd be like, well, that hurts a lot because I put it all on the line and they still left and I wasn't enough. It kind of goes back to what we said earlier. Like, I just and you don't enough. feel like you're controlling the narrative at that point. So you're just like, no, it can't, it can't just be who I am. Like I have to be able to control this situation socially. Um, and then when you do that, you're also months, weeks, whatever, years later, you know, you probably start thinking, well, now I can't really go back on that. Um, so you've created this place where you, if you start acting in a different way or you start acting Mm -hmm. more like your true self, then you're kind of admitting that you were lying and then you're self like you're calling yourself a liar in front of that person by changing your mind or shifting, which is unfortunate because I think people should be able to change their mind, but they shouldn't put out something false either. I mean, I think a lot of people end up putting out something false because that's what they needed to do to feel safe in their Mm -hmm. life. Um, And I think the moment that people stop having to live in survival mode for whatever reason, you know, there's like a variety of reasons that people like stop being authentic to themselves, like childhood, you know, Freudian idea stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. but like, and therapy is a good time and place for things to like kind of figure that out and and figure out who you are. But I think the difference in what I do from therapy is that you've kind of figured some stuff out and like you have to, at some point decide, I'm just, I'm just not willing to like live in survival mode anymore. Like I deserve to live a life that I'm like fucking happy, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. like that I will like, why should anybody or any idea that somebody has of me stop me from being the happiest person that I could be and like living the most fulfilled life that I can live. And like, that is like, like you said at the beginning, it is an actionable thing. Like you can make choices every day 
to start becoming the person who you want to be. You can't change who you have been. That's therapy. Figure that out, process it, because you might need to use some of those tools that you learned to mm -hmm. become the person you want to be or to learn why or what's stopping you from becoming the person you want to be. You know, like you might be hitting this wall and you're not really sure why. And you're like, why can I never consistently work out? That is like one of the reasons people come to me all the time and hmm. figuring out why or like, this is a great example, actually. I have a client re recently who went through, why am I not cooking for myself? And like, she, you know, she's like, when we first come into the program, nutrition is the most important thing for her. And she's like, I just hate to cook. And I'm like, okay, that's totally fine. You know, like not everybody needs to cook. You don't have to cook to be healthy um, or to feel healthy about yourself. And so we spent a couple of weeks of her experimenting with taking some, you know, like getting food service delivered or whatever, like, so she didn't have to cook. And she's like, okay, I'm, I feel like I'm eating enough. I'm eating, you know, for fueling myself. I'm eating, you know, feeling pretty good about like the amount I'm eating, but I'm still not feeling like it's fueling me correctly. And I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, like for her, it was right. It's not right for everybody to like track what you're eating and like count your macros or whatever. But it was a really good educational experience for her to realize, oh my gosh, like I am not eating very much protein. Like I mean a bunch of fat, like, and no wonder my digestive system feels a little funky because I'm not digesting the fat really well, whatever. So yeah. she's like, ah, oh, you know, like I know I can control <laughs> more of what I eat if I cook for myself. And I'm like, well, why don't you cook for yourself? So we spent a whole session talk figuring out like every time she was like, well, here's a reason, here's a reason. I'm like, well, what why? What happened? Why are you, you know, we just like dig and we get to the point where she's like, I watched my mom, like hate cooking and be in charge of the kitchen. And like my uh -huh. dad, it was like gender role thing. Like it was very expected in her family that the women in the family were supposed to be in the kitchen. And even between her and her brother, like her brother was never expected to do chores in the kitchen. And she always was. And her mom was like, well, you're a girl. I don't know what to tell you. And so now as an adult, independent, badass woman who has her own business, she's like crushing everything. She's still like hearing like this rebellion in her head of like, I will not be a woman who's like stuck in the kitchen. And I'm like, mm. okay, so don't be a woman who's stuck in the kitchen. That doesn't mean that, you know, she's like, well, if I start dating somebody and they see that I'm a good cook, I'm just, they're going to never cook. They're going to be like, well, I'm just not good at it. So you must do it. And I'm like, well, then just don't date somebody like that. <laughs> yeah. And it's like you yeah, or have that conversation like, when you get to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like her realizing that that was what was holding her back from cooking literally was the moment that she was like, this is crazy. I know I'm completely in control of the kind of relationship that I'm going to have. And I will never be in the same position as my mom because I won't let it happen. And that doesn't mean that I can't also be a badass cook. And all of a sudden she started cooking for herself. That's cool. That's <laughs> it was cool. really cool. Yeah. And it, it's like, so you need to, you need to understand your past to be in control of your future. But like, I think the biggest thing that holds people back is like, you know, not knowing and, and kind of going way back to the awareness stuff that we were talking about. Like, if you're not even aware, like you can't change stuff that you're not aware of, you know? Right. I think that's the people's biggest fear of therapy is you're going to go back, you're going to dive in and you're going to pull something up out of nowhere. That's going to change my opinion on something or make me hate somebody or make me blame somebody when that's not often what happens. You just kind of look at some initial reactions to things and you, you don't assess blame. You just mm -hmm. say, Oh, maybe this is an original reason why I think this way. And that's it. You, you know, yeah. you don't, you don't have to make changes from there. You don't have to blame anybody or throw anybody under the bus. Um, but you could at least at the very least, you could have, uh, the idea of a root cause assess it and say, huh, yeah, maybe I didn't like that originally because I was in that situation or because I saw somebody be in that situation. Yeah. And I think and the thing that, that stumbles people the most is like that because of something that happened that you weren't totally conscious of, mm. you start developing behaviors because of that. And, and then you get, to, you know, when you're a kid, a teenager in college, you know, and none of us were aware of anything that we were doing, you know, and then you get to be the point where you're like 30, 40, 50 years old. And you are like, I am so well practiced. I have put in thousands of hours of passing without locking my elbows. <laughs> like, you know, and yep. it's like, why am I not a good passer? 
I, but I'm so good at this, you know, and I'm kind of, I'm actually pretty good passer like this because I've practiced it so much, but like there's a whole nother level of improvement that you're, uh, that's available to you if you just block your elbows, but it's going to be hard because you've never practiced that before. You know, I love using volleyball analogies in my sessions. <laughs> right. No, because you had like some random elbow injury when you started volleyball, you know, like maybe that was happening, you know, you get like one yeah. hyperextension feel and you're like, Oh, that, that stung. Like, so now I, I can never leave my arm straight and you figured it out. Um, and maybe no one ever told you because you'd never really gotten a good coach. No one ever told you that locking your elbows would actually make you a better passer. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, 40 years old, 10 or 15 years into your volleyball career. And you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's And all your partners look at you and like, you know, that's wrong, but they don't have this, the, the question of why don't you straighten your elbows? You know, no, no, they just look at you and say, uh, crappy passer instead of looking at you and say, have you ever tried straightening your elbows? Yeah. It, it, you know, um, yeah. I think a lot of partnerships could do, could do better for that. If there's a little exposure, a little call out of here's what I think you do poorly here's how that i would takes beat vulnerability. you it does yeah and especially because they could be like screw you i know better than you or like i don't want to hear it i don't want your advice you know right so the vulnerability part wrapped back up <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's it's nice it's a little advantage and uh, i did this little exercise i guess it was two three years ago um where i shot a message to my last five partners and i shot a message and i said Hey, I uh, just want, you know, your honest opinion. You don't have to take long. You don't have to go short, but I go, what was the worst part about playing with me? That's all I want to know. What was the worst mm -hmm. part about playing with me? Um, and uh, it, it turned out that like my uh, expectations of each point were just super, super high for each point. And that there is always this feeling of pressure and that somebody like could or should be doing more. Um, and yeah, I put, I put all that pressure on myself my whole life of like, should mm -hmm. be doing more, could be doing more. Um, and I can imagine that that's not fun to play with. And then as soon as I got those responses, I looked at, uh, she wasn't my fiance yet then, but I was like, oh my God, could you imagine living every day with somebody who makes you feel like <laughs> you could and should be doing more? Like you're never quite living up to their expectations. Um, and so then I had to learn to start just just straight up celebrating people more instead of thinking in what I thought positively was like a coach mindset of, mm -hmm. yeah, I, as a good leader, I can help you become the best version of yourself instead of how do I celebrate who you are right now? And you'll take yourself to the next place. You know, um, yeah. that was a really, really important exercise for me that I encourage everyone to do even that the bad breakups like hey no we haven't talked uh, since last season when we you know we're not playing together anymore but i just want to know what do you think like what are what's the skill that you think i'm weakest at and what was the worst part about playing with me and you'll get some i think a lot of people would get very surprising answers but that's a terrifying yeah. exercise because not one of them said what was the worst part about playing with me yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like once you but, opened it so, up one way, it didn't come back the other way. And you're just like, yeah, all right, cool. If you don't want to know, then that's fine. That's exactly what we were talking about earlier, though, is like that is being vulnerable because that's definitely going to be something hard to hear. Um, mm -hmm. And something, again, like you said, that might not be like reciprocal. It's obviously like easier if you're like, oh, this is a mutual exercise. We're both going to, you know, tell each other the shit that's going on. <laughs> uh, it's harder when it's one way for sure. And it's exactly what we talked about with like, you never, you, you just, you don't know what you don't know. And like judging people for what they don't know is just stupid. That's just point. You're never going to like be able to read somebody's mind. You're never going to be, and no one should expect to read your mind. So the fact that like you went out of your way to develop awareness, which is what we talked about earlier. So now probably in a match, in a live match, you are probably able to be like, I'm doing a thing where I'm setting the expectations really high. I can see my partner struggling because of it. And I can change now because I know it. And you couldn't do that before because you didn't even know what was happening. Right. So yeah. pretty powerful. It is. It's crazy powerful. <laughs> and it's nice to be able to realize that to like hold certain things back that have become automatic for yourself and say like, maybe it doesn't have to be automatic. I still have a line. 
you know, um, I still like uh, with Dave in this last tournament uh, at some point, you know, he didn't peel once, didn't peel twice uh, on very offsets. And on the last one, I, I let him have it. I was like, you have mm -hmm. to get off the net at that, you know? <laughs> um, and I didn't let go of it. And, but then I let him know right away. I was like, ready for the mm -hmm. next point. But like, let's, let's peel. We're going to get points. Everybody's weak. It's too windy. Um, and they're going to hit deep. So let's get out of there. But he, mm -hmm. he did get a couple blocks by staying. It's just, I felt we could control the ball a little bit more if we were, you know, peeling in some situations, but I would have years ago, I would have been like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Or I would have stayed yeah. quiet to make sure that he was happy, you know, I yeah. would have done that, yeah. but then to not, me staying to not quiet and not boat. saying anything, then he would, yeah, you don't rock the boat, but then, mm -hmm. you, then you get this tension of, you're like, oh, he's still not getting it. He's still not getting it because you haven't told him said anything you haven't yeah. shared what you expected or said do you think you should peel there i think that's yeah so i think i actually think that is a more interesting way to do it uh, not that i'm great at it myself so i'm i'm very similar to you and in that way um mm -hmm. of like i'm either like telling it all or just holding back completely um but i think the way that i've tried to approach it is like as much as i might know the person i'm playing with and know their game really well I don't know it as well as they know it. And I'm sure there's a reason why they're staying or not, you know, to use your example, like, you know, Dave knows his own game better than you know his game. So like, I wonder what his, and it, it's tough because in an actual tournament situation, it's like you have like seconds to communicate this, right? So there's mm -hmm. not always time for this, but like, and so I'm kind of trying, personally this year is one of the things I'm working on is like trying to find the ways and like the speed and the timing and whatever of like having these little conversations because at the end of the day in, in these tournaments, you're like not making the main draw by like two points pretty much every time. So like to get that one point where you do pull and you do get the thing or he does stay, but he does it differently, you know, like that is a difference in the match. And that's the difference in maybe your career because like, uh, like 2019, like best year on the AVP so far, right? The only reason 2019 was my best year and the only reason I made the finals in 2019 was because I won by two points in the qualifier. So like if those two points had gone a different way, I might never have made a main draw. You know, I might never have developed points. So it's like, really, it can change your career. And so I wonder like how, like, and I'm curious what you think too, but like if you if you some way are like, the intention of the question is, my perception is this is not working. You probably have a good reason why you're staying and you know the game really well too. Like, why are you staying and what are you trying to get out of it? And like, let's agree on a plan together based on my strengths too, you mm. know? And I don't know how to communicate that very quickly yet, <laughs> but something I'm working on because especially when you play with a bunch of different people, like, I, you know, I might go show up at a, turn. like I'm Austin. I'm, I've never played with Katie Spieler in my life. So we're going to show up and like have to do this Just really dance. fast, Just you know? Show up and dance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's, it's a really huge part of the sport that that's something that we can, you know, all get better at for sure. Yeah. We, uh, we kind of uh, take it over. We have this little form that, that partner profile that it makes you define uh, certain plays. So, uh, it, it says like, you actually have to name and describe your exact set height. Do you like it a certain, how many feet off the net do you want it? Uh, how, how far from the setter do you want it? What about in transition? Do you like to come back and be fast or do you like everything to slow down in transition? Uh, we give people that on the partner profile, but I think first of all, having that conversation beforehand and just both go through a one page exercise of describe your set to me and not mm -hmm. kind of with you, you know, I want to stay close. Learn to describe your actual set yeah. as, as if like it, it had a, uh, you know, it was a flow chart on, on an architectures on an architect's scheme, right? Yep. <laughs> I need inches. Uh, how high above the antenna do you actually want it? Cause Dave said, uh, top of the antenna. And I set him a few balls and he's like, higher, higher, higher. It's like, okay, so you want this ball four balls above the top of the antenna. Like, <laughs> that's your antenna ball, you know? Yeah. And so that's one kind of way to describe it. But I think the, the, what do you think here? What do you think in this situation? Mm -hmm. um, especially as, as soon as it's exposed. But as a player, you need to have the main things 
as a conversation out of the way before you play. Do you want to run faster or slower in transition? Do you want to peel more or block more? Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you know anything about this player? I like the, do you know anything about this player? Um, yeah. have, you know, have you ever beaten them in some situations? Uh, I would actually change those to more open-ended questions. If it were me, I would say, what do you know about this player? Because that's, the only way to answer that question Great. is to provide information and asking, do you know anything is like, no, I don't <laughs> It's mm. like, really, you know, nothing <laughs> like, I don't believe you. <laughs> it's been eight years on tour. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, it's like asking me, like, it's if, if I come like and say, Hey Mark, did you have a good day? It's like, mm. like, well, if I say yes, then I had a good day. And if I say mm. no, then I had a bad day. But what if I didn't have either? Right. So now I'm like stuck. <laughs> can you just ask me like, how was your day? And then I can tell you what I want. You know, I think open-ended yeah. questions in the, in these situations can be like really helpful. Yeah. What'd you do for lunch? <laughs> yeah. You know, start at least some kind of information flow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's for, for me at least it, it coming with new partners, it's about having those talks first and then literally dialing the set in, I think the most important part. Mm -hmm. um is going to be the set because that's your eight nine out of ten so you have to know situationally like okay but if you pass off the net i know what you want in a perfect when we're doing hitting lines i know mm -hmm. like what you want there but what if you pass uh at half court uh what if you pass two-thirds back into the court are you going to flow totally. outside or are you still going to stay narrow so that's why when i show up with a new partner i just i'll catch the ball you know, uh, and I'll say, okay, pass me at half court, pass me at three quarters court. Where do you want this one? Where do you want mm -hmm. this one? You know, and I'll say, pass me to the antenna. Are you going to follow me all the way? Or do you want me to keep pushing that? Because I can push it yeah. if you want, you know. So yeah. just tackling those kind of everyday situations quick and establishing mm -hmm. a general rule for that is a very good thing. But all yeah. of these people who say, no, that was perfect. Oh, that was a great set. Just like that. You need to tell me why. It yeah. was a great set. What about it? What numerical values made it a 10 out of 10? And yeah, personally, I love playing with Adam Roberts. Um, He's great at that. <laughs> that's his main question. And I pick yeah. that up from him and I use it with every partner. He goes, was that a 10 out of 10? Was it a 9 out of 10? Was it an 8 out of 10? What would make it a 10? And mm -hmm. that's like that series of questions is what he goes through after he sets you. And you're yeah. like, oh. Okay, you know, so he really gets to know it, and yeah, and I definitely I've stolen that from him completely. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another benefit of playing with different people, you get little tidbits like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, man, you know, uh, we we didn't get to too much volleyball, but in a way, this is everything <laughs> volleyball. Uh, yeah, I do just want to ask you one question, just for the the people who are um, out there and training and want to be like you, what are you, what weaknesses are you currently working on and how are you trying to fix them in your game? Um, I, I think the biggest thing that I'm trying to do in my game is really almost what we've been talking about this whole time is like really just trying to play more authentically to me. Um, I think I found myself like giving up control of my career to other people for different reasons and like um really stopped being myself on the court um to to try to make it work with people you know like with different partner situations um and i think the only thing that left me with is like a lack of confidence in myself because i'm not myself on the court so like how am I supposed to like play my best when I'm not like feeling like I can be myself and so getting back to being myself and playing I think the, the coolest part about this sport is like there is so many cool ways to play and you can be so creative and you or you can be so basic like you can be mm -hmm. Phil and Nick and set a sky ball to each other for years for like nine years and still be really successful or you can be the Swiss, you know, boys that are new to town and like jump setting and running the indoor offense. And like, there's yep. so many different ways to succeed. Um, so, you know, I think my, my biggest weakness 
right now that I'm working through is like just rebuilding a little bit of like lack of self-trust in my volleyball career. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of very valid reasons why I lost that trust and where I lost my way a little bit. And I think this is like the first year that, um, I felt as confident in my preparation as I used to. Um, I think the pandemic obviously threw all of us off and this is like my first year really feeling like I had the off seasons, like I used to have like the training, the weightlifting, the, like everything else in my life kind of stability that I needed to like feel confident in myself. Yeah. Um, and I think I learned a lot in the last couple of years, having that lack of stability in our sport um, about what I needed, which, you know, take it or leave it, it would have been cool without it, but I learned a lot about myself <laughs> with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I think a lot of the conversations we had there is exactly what I'm working on. Like, I think a lot of people I've played with in the last year, probably wouldn't even be able to give me a accurate answer to what you asked um, your old partners. Like what's the worst part about playing with me? Because like, I don't even know if I would like want to ask them because it, it I don't even feel like I played like myself when I played with them, mm. you know, yeah. um, it's been an interesting new thing that I've never really had to deal with in my career. I've always like kind of unashamedly played like myself with, you know, whatever I bring to the court that day. So it's, it's been interesting. Um, and it's taken a lot of new approaches to the game that I haven't really like done before. You know, I, I haven't really been the kind of person to, um, like do a lot of in practice self-reflection or like take notes or whatever. And I've been a lot more of that this year because, uh, I needed what we've talked about in this, in this conversation. I need, I really needed that awareness. Um, and I really needed perspective. Um, so it, it took me like bringing in a coach that I really trust. Uh, Pre-Lima has, we've had like a really crazy relationship over the last eight years where we've like hated each other, not talked to each other, worked together. And now she's like really been one of the most important people to like bring me back to playing like myself, which I'm really thankful for. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I feel like I like season is kind of just starting, but I really feel like I've played a lot of tournaments already where I've like worked through a lot of it. So I'm really excited for Austin next week and, and to get a chance to like be on, on the court on a big stage where I'm like fully playing like myself. I'm pretty excited about that. That's awesome. Yeah. If, if you were to, I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there. And every time I say that on that podcast, it's because it's what I think. Um, so I'm sure <laughs> there are a lot of people out there <laughs> uh, that, go through the process of trying to figure out what type of player they actually are or should be, you know, mm -hmm. should I be hyped up all the time? Should I be the guy that has the chip on my shoulder? Should I just sleepwalk and chill? Um, should I be the guy who fires my partner up all the time? Uh, and discovering that is, I think a difficult process because you guess you don't measure, you know? So you say like, you know what, I'm going to be all hyped up today. And then you don't actually go back after that day and measure your performance. Say, all right, when I was completely rowdy, was I hitting better? Was my side out better? You know, if I embrace this personality for however long, uh, what was my actual play like? So for you, my question would be, how does somebody, you said reflection, you gave us one tool, but how mm -hmm. does somebody discover and try to play like themselves? I mean, I think that's an on and off the court process for sure. I think, uh, I think you can measure it. I think it's like, it's just whether or not you're like winging it or whether or not you're actually having a plan, you know, it's like, it's not really an experiment if I don't measure it and plan for it, like, and have like the, like, so I, this is something that I talk to some of the girls that I train with all the time. Like you should be using practice to practice being the person you want to be in a game mm -hmm. and uh, practice. So, you know, there's been practices where like, you know, if your coach is like on you and you are like a hot mess and you're like, you need to leave me alone. Like I need space, whatever. And they're not. And they're just like, duh, 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 duh. And it's like, honestly, I've been in a match where the crowd was doing that to me. So I'm not going to stop my coach from doing that to me. I'm going to take a second to be like, okay, I've been in this situation before. I've watched myself react in this way. Mm. This time I'm going to try like 
doing a variety of things. Like you could try hugging your partner after every play that you could try, you know, going on your knees and cheering to the crowd after every play. You could try just like having chit chat, like in the whole play and just being like, kind of like obnoxiously over it, you know, or you could try being like tunnel vision. Like it's yeah. like having, like actually making it a plan, committing to it and doing it for like a period of time. And then being like, like you said, like, how did I feel about how I played? I don't even know if I would say like, did I pass better? Or like, did I hit better? Because you can't control all of those things necessarily. Mm. Um, you can control though. And like your confidence level can be in a certain place. So I think I would probably personally measure it by like my confidence level of like, when I did this, I felt like myself and I was like, I can play like myself. Cause even when I'm playing like myself, it's not always like my best, you know, but yeah. at least I'm like present. So right. I think that's gotta be so hard. It's such a challenge, but it's so hard to have a situation that you're used to just having an emotional reaction to and instead treating it as if, you know, you're untying a knot, <laughs> you know, like, should I pull this side? Should I pull this side? Should I like dig it with my nails or my teeth? You know, mm -hmm. taking this, this thing that you hate feeling you're mad or you're angry or you just want to kill whoever's talking or whoever's next to you and saying, huh, the emotions right now are, are a problem that I can solve. So how do I make this situation different or how do I change myself here so that I'm not just being emotionally reactive and that I'm actually controlling the next step? I, I think that's huge. I think that's probably the biggest challenge yeah, for most people. Which is why I think beach volleyball one of the requirements to be a really good player in beach volleyball is emotional intelligence i mean i think like and i think people underestimate like that is not something that you should only be practicing on the court like if you're having an argue like if i come home and i'm having an argument with my husband like okay i'm gonna do the same thing like i'm gonna realize that i'm getting upset like i'm gonna be like what did i make for myself as a plan to try when i'm upset this way i'm gonna do it and like, see what happens. Did I like it? Mm. Did I feel like it worked out? You know, like, it's not something like you, people say all the time, like there's those players who are like acting when they play, you know, and you're like, ah, oh, this guy's such a dick when he's on the court, but off the court, he's such a cool guy. And I'm mm. like, I just don't believe that. Like, I think what? who you are, I think who you are is who you are. And I think if you choose to play like someone who is a dick sometimes on the court, like, and that works for you. That's awesome. And I'm not going to be one to judge you for that. I don't mm. think that necessarily makes you a bad person. Like, but I think it is how you handle situations. Like if I were to push you emotionally off the court, I can have a good guess about how you're going to respond. Wow. In my opinion. I completely disagree. <laughs> I, you know, I take a look at like the field of battle as that's who they are in that situation. But you're not just battling on the court. Like you battle off the court too. Yeah. But those are completely different types of battles. Like I'm, I'm not going to get in a hand to hand combat the same way that I would play Monopoly. It, you know, like there's going to be a very different r level of reaction there. And I think that <laughs> part of like the beauty of sport is also that it's, it is part acting like you get to choose your character on the court and maybe you know maybe you're right in saying that okay you know at some point you have to play like yourself who you are but maybe your basketball self your tennis self your volleyball self is incredibly different than your living room self you know so I'm not saying on day to day, I'm saying when you get pushed to the point where it's make or break on the court, I don't think that you're a different person that you are off the court on the court. So like, I would ask you, if you feel like when you last time you had an argument with somebody that was really important to you, and there was like a huge disagreement, I wonder how you feel how much you feel like you were acting in that moment versus just letting yourself be however you felt like being. Um, I felt like I had controlled the reactions. <laughs> Is controlling the reaction not acting? I mean, yeah. Because I think when I've gotten upset before, before, I could just let myself be like, screw you. Like it would feel so good to just like let it all out. Rah, that person, you know? 
or I could act because I mm -hmm. know that I like, I know what would happen if I let myself fully let go. And that's not the reaction I want to have. So same on the court to me is that like, you know, I could react in a certain way, but I might not get what I want. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, there's been games where I've played like, you know, girls coming out of college and they're hot and they're emotional and they like feed off of your anger. And so the first time I played some girls that, that used to play in college, like, they pissed me off. Their parents were super annoying. So I was like, okay, I can play that game. So I mm -hmm. got, you know, I was giving it to them. We were going back and forth. Oh my God. They were like playing the best volleyball they've ever played in their lives. <laughs> Second time I played them, I was like, I wonder what's going to happen if I'm just like so fucking friendly the whole match. So before the match, I just like went and sat and chatted next to them. And I was like, you know, not like it's, I don't actually want to like get to know them. Like everybody mm -hmm. in the beach volleyball world is cool, but like, I want to control how they're going to act on the court. So mm -hmm. in between side switches and like high five and them, like, God, that was a great swing. And like, man, they did not have the energy they had the last time I played them. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's, it's acting, you know, and I certainly def I believe that I do that when I'm like, you know, in any way, like getting put in a position where I might not, you know, who you let yourself be and who you choose to be is the difference between, I feel like acting and not, you know, hmm. but choosing hmm. to be someone I think can still be authentic. It can be. Yeah. Uh, because I think like chameleons can be authentic, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I really do. Um, yeah. uh, who is it? Trevor, Trevor Noah. I think he talked about that. He's like, he, yes, like I can be, essentially he's like he said I, I can be like black when i'm black with my south african friends yeah uh, i can be a talk show host a celebrity talk show host i can be somebody that tears you apart because i believe what you're doing is wrong and i will put you like uh, to a point and he's like this the power of a chameleon is probably one of the most it should be feared the most yeah uh because you can slide into any environment and do and get what you want you know, yeah. because of your ability to change. So. But I think that can be authentic. You know, I think that, that, that everyone has all of these, like, it's, it's like how you can have like a bunch of different kinds of best friends. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I have a best friend who's my day-to-day -day person and we can like go to the grocery store together. Or like, I have my best friend who I could take a badass trip with and we can have a great time. Or like, I can tell this friend about these things. It's like, you have different colors of your personality that like, manifest in different ways and i think that's like exactly it it's like i can choose to pull out what part of my personality like i need but i don't think that that changes based on mm -hmm. this like i don't think it changes who you are i don't think trevor noah is a different person because he's acting differently with his black friends than he is with his white friends you know right. he's still the same person mm -hmm. yeah in my opinion <laughs> yeah yeah to be to be determined on if the person on the court and their personality <laughs> there is the same as the person off the court. To me, I've, I've always let people be whoever they want to be on a court and I mm -hmm. will not judge them until I'm not seeing them compete uh, and, and seeing, you know, uh, and, and feeling their competition against me. Mm -hmm. Like I know that people will be a jerk to me on a court and I'll definitely be a jerk to them on a court, <laughs> but I, I don't treat people like that socially, you know? Um, yeah, but you're in a different environment, but it's still you. Like if you needed that part of your personality in a social situation, I think you would do it. You know, if there was some reason. Yeah, I could definitely go to that. Yeah. If I yeah needed, wanted to. Yeah. You know, like if you needed to stand up for yourself, somebody else, or like be like, nah, this is not happening or like fight for some reason, you know, like that's life. So, mm -hmm. you know, in my, in my opinion, it's just like, part of who you are but you know now i think it's like gonna be a grander philosophical volleyball question to, yeah. to see to get yeah. some different opinions on <laughs> love to hear uh from anyone who's listening uh if there's a comment section anywhere on this do you think this is for the audience out there <laughs> do you think that the way somebody competes on their court uh, whatever sport it is do you think that that is an accurate reflection of who they are as a person and how they would react interpersonally. I'd love to hear uh, everybody's thoughts. So if you guys want to check that into the comments and uh, share some stories and share some opinions, would love yeah. to, to hear about that and see some different things. So go ahead, everybody start typing. <laughs> yeah. yeah.
that's it. It's, I'm interested to see what people, different people think about that. Yeah, we'll be. Yeah. Kim, um, I got to thank you. This is, this is one of the most awesome talks I've had in a long time. Uh, absolute pleasure uh, to get to know you a little bit more, uh, to hear your expertise and, and your thoughts and opinions uh, and your, your knowledge on all of the interpersonal skills and, and your volleyball path. And we didn't really even dive into like the, <laughs> the whole like 15 questions that I sent you ahead of time. <laughs> That's why I said like when we loosely converse around those questions, I was like, it's very loose. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, I'm here for good conversations anytime. I think it was super interesting to hear. You know, I always think it's interesting to hear different perspectives on this stuff for sure. Yeah. Well, I'd uh, love to have you on again. Um, and this is kind of your moment to, uh, if you have anywhere where people should reach out to you for what, uh, if you want to go ahead and, and talk about your company for a second, uh, we'd love to share it with our audience. And uh, you can share your Instagrams, your Facebooks, your websites. Just go ahead. Yeah, uh, my website's listed on the bottom of the screen here, healthcoachingwithcam.com. is a great way to kind of learn more about my business and what I do. Um, and I do a lot of uh, mindset and life and health coaching. It's kind of like all one because I believe that people are, you know, like, like kind of what we were just saying, like, I really believe that every part of you is connected. So if you're struggling with your nutrition or the way that you're moving is usually like why people come to me in the first place. Um, you know, in my experience, a lot of the reasons why is because there's other stuff in your life that really isn't like aligned and going well. Um, and I think I'm pretty good at helping people problem solve that. So, uh, that's kind of what I do for a living. I, you know, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, sometimes I do group coaching or team coaching. If anybody's interested, uh, it's the cool thing about having your own business is it gets to be whatever you want it to be. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of fun with that and, and um, Instagram's always available. Yeah. For those who are listening, uh, and not being able to see the screen, it's health coaching with Kim dot com um everything True. is spelled exactly how you would expect it to be spelled health coaching with kim dot com okay and your instagram uh, my instagram is just kim underscore hill um, has a link to my um company on there as well and you're ha happy to respond to dms from anybody I, that's how i do a lot of my coaching and, and outreach for people too so um yeah those are my two mains right there <laughs> awesome Awesome. Kim, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, hope you have a great day and uh, good luck this season. Kick some butt. Thanks. Looking, looking you too. forward to seeing you see uh, seeing you play some Kim Hildreth volleyball. Me too. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day. You too. Bye.